Okay, now we have today a very exciting speaker, Mark Steffick, who I worked with so long ago, I won't tell you the year, but um, at that time he was making a room that was full of screens and you could collaborate with anybody in this room in a way that allowed you to use these tools, Argnoter and Cognoter, to help uh, amplify people's collaboration. And uh, we had an anthropologist in the back of the room watching these experiences. We wrote papers together, great big fancy Dorado computers, hundreds of thousands of dollars for these personal computers that, that now probably aren't as fancy as what was in, in your pocket, but they were incredible. And the software was written by the people that worked there with Mark. Mark worked on many, many things over his career at Zarks Park, 45 years, was it? Close to. Yeah, close to. Um, including he's probably uh, has done more for um, for understanding uh, digital rights than anybody else uh, in the world, uh, has patents on it, and he's done a lot for creating the languages and the ways that um, AI languages work. He has recently did a very big project on explainable AI that was, um, that was a big DARPA contract across many organizations. So... Um, Great guy, and I'm very proud to have him here. And he wants to talk about um, creating AIs with human compatible values. And I want to know, um, Mark, whether you want us to hold our questions or dive in as we're as we're um, doing this um, to to um, uh, to ask questions of you. So, Mark, uh, please tell us about creating AIs with human uh, compatible. Um, no. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm, I've been looking forward to this talk. Um, I've been on an adventure for the last year or so, um, having completed that uh, DARPA project that, that Ted mentioned, um, at the end of which I believe we delivered everything to DARPA they needed to know. I've got papers on it. That's not the subject of tonight. But at the end of that, I just said I didn't know what I was talking about. That I really needed to rethink AI. I'm saying this as a person who's written AI textbooks, who's been in the field for a very long time, who um, has, had, but has also been between AI and Kai. Right? For a substantial part of my career, I wasn't sure which field I was in. And as, it, as will become clear in this, uh, I'm probably in both, but, but in a sense, I'm really finding out that questions matter. So this talk today is really gonna be about interesting questions we can ask, especially if you have a field which is doing things but it doesn't have the basis for asking the questions that it really needs to ask, <clears throat> which is a theme that I'll be going through today a little bit with you. So this is about uh, AIs with deep, like what is a deep human compatible value? What is a human compatible value? That's something that Stuart Russell promoted very much in, in his textbook, Ben Schneiderman also has been talking about that. Um, but I think part of what's been happening in a big way for the last 10 years or so has been the rise of machine learning. That was important for the project I was working on. It's important for its, what seems almost like a land rush right now. As the chips are being built, the foundation models are being built, cloud computing is happening. Um, people are starting to build applications. And lots of questions are being raised about what the AIs are doing. So a fundamental thing, which I've heard lots of times in the sort of good news, bad news, it's great, I'm terrified conversations that fill in media is uh, do AIs have values? Um, in fact, there's uh, four questions here um, I wanted to, to, to raise with you, which are kind of worries that people ask. About, can this AI cause harm? <clears throat> are its decisions safe or are they biased? Um, what should AIs prioritize? Is this AI trustworthy? That's where the explainable AI stuff sort of came in. You want to know why is it reasoning this way or that? Um, under what conditions is having a human in the loop improve things or make them worse? Okay, let's, are feature eyes powerful enough? This one's kind of amazing. It, it traces back to mythology and so many stories about um, the machine that got built, the sorcerer's apprentice. Um, will AIs take over? Will we become as humans obsolete? So what is the basis for asking questions like that? The, the worry that I hear from people is, uh, well, what values do AIs have? And so this is where my, my beginning on questions will come to you. Here are, here are four, five questions, um, which I believe we could ask in AI, but which AI doesn't actually address. 
what are human compatible values? And what is their nature? Like, what is a value anyway? Um, here's what, here's a, a one, I, one of my favorite questions. What are the origins? Like, where do values come from? And what, what is the utility of a value? If you have a value, does, what does that improve for you or, or for the species? Now, we're talking about building human compatible values. If that really made sense, why is it that different groups of people have different values? So are we so human compatible to who? Is that question? I don't even hear that question in the common debate. Um, another question: How do we acquire values? Are they innate? Are we born with them? Well, where do they come from? Um, are humans the only creatures that have values? Do whales have values? You know, so I will touch on some of these things as we go forward, or even if we build AIs that are supposed to have values, will they maintain those values? How might that work? So those questions, as it turns out, and as we'll touch on as we go through here, actually come from different disciplines because AI is not asking them. So I wish to give you a little tour of some of the places where those questions get asked and where possible answers lie. Um, but before um, starting the tour, I want to read you something about the nature of questions. I ran into this just a couple of weeks ago, and I loved it, and so I want to share it with you. It's a very short quote by John Donahue. A question is like a lantern. It illuminates new landscapes in new areas as it moves. Therefore, the question always assumes that there are many different dimensions to a thought that you are either blind to or not available to you. So a question is really one of the forms in which wonder expresses itself. So we ask because we are wondering something. We ask a question about it. So I love that. I love the sense of wonder, of exploration. And so I will ask these questions about AIs and the possibility of building them, but trying to ground us in questions which can actually lead us towards answers, which can tell us things which aren't even in the public debate right now. And that's why, I, and I hope that you enjoy these. You asked whether to take questions as we go. Um, if we have a short question, I, I will try to answer it. Otherwise, I would like to leave maybe 30 minutes or something at the end where we can just have a general discussion. But whatever's on your mind that comes up as a consequence of the things we've talked about. So um, these questions about AIs and are they biased and so on, these have been the subject of science fiction, um, um, mythology, cautionary technology essays for a long time. And similar concerns have come from all those different places. Um, and the view, like if you listen to Elon Musk's recent talks about Optimus, he envisions robots in the home, robots in the hospital, robots in different places. Um, it seems though, if we, if, we're, if we want to have robots in these critical roles, um, our concern about the values they have are different than the concerns you might have about a little eye robot that's buzzing around the room and getting the dust up. It, it matters what the robot or the AI is doing, whether we really care what its values are. So I'd like to start with a really very basic question. What's a value? Now, in asking this question, I'm not trying to, I'll touch on a number of different values. And you could uh, well, we'll say, well, who writes about values? Well, it turns out there's different theories of values that draw on. These are like, like sort of separate domains. There's philosophical theories of values. There's economic theories of values. There's um, ethical principles of values. Okay, And those are all like different domains. You say, these are the values. When I first asked these questions, I thought, what do values come from? And I thought of things like, well, like the commandments and the Christian religion. Are those values? Or I thought of... Uh, uh, um, Isaac Asimov's laws for robotics. Do, do those express values? So, we're, so my question, what are values? So I want to look to see what, where, where, who's got theories of values. So a first one I want to mention to you is Brene Brown. Some of you may know of her. She's a, a, a great speaker on leadership, and, and she has a list of 100 values. Let me, let, so, I'm, so I'll be giving examples of values just to give you a sense of the range of what these things could be. So she says, well, the values include accountability for leaders, adaptability, altruism, authenticity, confidence, courage, integrity, loyalty, and, and the next 90 of them. So there's a whole bunch of things that she calls values, 100 and some. Well, here's another source of values. There's a book written by a couple of um, uh, parents who had a lot of children, it made a lot of, it's Linda and Richard Iyer's popular book on teaching values to your children. 
what are their values like? Well, they actually have two kinds of values, values of being and values of giving. So they will include honesty, truthfulness, trustworthiness. Imagine asking these things of an AI, is it trustworthy? Does it have integrity, courage? Is it peaceable? Well, courage, you might think of, will it sacrifice itself for a human or what? It could, will it go into a dangerous situation? Should it protect itself? So I'm not trying to take a stand on whether it should have that value or whether it's a good value. I just want to know what a value is. And so, the, so these are examples. Some of them, it's not clear how they apply to robots. Chastity and fidelity. Self-discipline, maybe. Self-reliance. Okay, well then, here's an extreme theory of value. And this one, there's a couple of people who espouse this one. They say integrity is enough to explain all the rest. Um, now this is Werner Earhart. If you remember, some of you may have heard him in, of him in Est. And his, his co-author is Michael Jensen and Steve Zafroni. Basically, they say, look, there are these domains of values, but no, no set of values works if, you, if your total set of values doesn't make sense as a whole. Um, another sort of writer, um, uh, Mar uh, Martha Beck, has the way of integrity. She espouses essentially the same theory with, uh, with a lot less philosophy. So now I want to look at the science that could underlie this question about what values are. Um, and the person I'm going to go to first is Robert Axelrod. You might know of him from the prisoner dilemma and all the research experiments he, he did on that. Here's, here's Robert's question. Under what conditions will cooperation, so I was looking at cooperation as, as something that we might think is valuable. Under what conditions will cooperation emerge in a world of egoists without central authority? Like if somebody can impose it or write down these are the rules, maybe you could get um, cooperation to happen. They don't want to work together. They must work together. The question has intrigued people for a long time, and for good reason. We know that people we know that people are not angels, that they need to look after themselves and their own first. Yet we also know that society, cooperation does occur, and our civilization is based on it. So without cooperation, we wouldn't even have a civilization. Um, but in situations where each individual has an incentive to be selfish, how could cooperation ever develop? So when I, I read his book, The Evolution of, of Cooperation, that question rang in my head. How could, how, well, how did it evolve? And then I remembered, because I had a long career and, and dipped into a lot of different kinds of fields, I remembered sociobiology. How many people here know of sociobiology or is a field? A few, few of you do. So this is a branch of biology that includes the study of animal behavior and social species. Um, and Edwin O. Wilson is, is pre predominantly known in that thing. And Wilson had a very direct and simple answer to that question about anything that emerges from evolution. He says the brain or any cognitive system or any other part of your body emerges because it promotes the survival and multiplication of the genes that direct its assembly. This is like Richard Dawkins' The Selfish Gene Book from 1976. So there was a lot of confusion about things like altruism, which I'll come to in a little bit. He says, but look, there's an engine. That engine is evolution. It causes mutations. It tries out a version of the body. If it, if it succeeds in reproducing, you get more of them. And that's called success. So, that's where, so that would mean that brains or anything else that holds some, something which governs behavior is going it's to exist because it, it favors on the survival and propagation. Um, but then that really, so, so then he studies, this is Edwin O. Wilson, on himself studying insect behavior, insect altruism, human behavior, wolf behavior, whale behavior. And um, one of the things he, he's, puzz he's puzzled about is, well, he said that the, the difference is in the in the, between the vertebrates and in insects and how they do cognition is immense. Um, and yet there's similar in very many important ways. So he's looking at parallel evolution, but the evolution has to be something whereby these things, which we'll call values or competences, you know, we'll get into the relationship between those two things, are, are there because evolution puts them there. Okay, so I still haven't defined a value. I've simply said, these are examples of them. And I said, well, gosh, there's 100 of them from Rene Brin. There's, there's 12 of them from this person. And, and Werner Earhart says there's only one. It's called integrity. Well, operationally, what do we want to say is a value? I see Ted smiling. I'm not, maybe this is getting to be humorous. But, it's just, but notice when people say, my God, what values does the AI have? We don't even ask the question what a value is. And I'm trying to take you on a tour of how we might answer that question. So I'm going to give you an operational definition of a value. The agent's values 
are its interpretations of the conditions that govern its actions. In other words, if you think of an agent as doing things, it decides when to do it, what to do, and, and that sort of thing, the conditions under which it does it will, will govern its behavior. We are looking at behavior when we're trying to induce what values the agent has. Okay, now we sort of have a way of how we can infer the values of something by seeing whether that behavior is, consist is consistent with owning a particular value. So um, going on to the next sort of piece of this thing, um, well, let's take altruism then. Altruism is sometimes said to be a value. It's one of the ones that was a big puzzle for, for sociobiology. And altruism is where um, a member of a species takes on a behavior which serves others but doesn't necessarily serve itself. Well, so, say, so there's a big controversy about this um, back, back for, 19, for the 1970s. Like, how, how can we explain it? Um, and so let's look at the, the case of ants, for example. For, so an ants, um, worker ants, most ants are actually sterile females. Um, reproduction in the ant colony is done by the queen with an occasional male contributing a little bit to it. And the worker ants sacrifice themselves. From a selfish gene point of view, which is like, how does that gene propagate? How does that possibly work? Well, these ants don't reproduce anyway. The genes that they carry are exactly the same genes that are carried by the queen. So if they ensure the survival of the colony, their genes get propagated more. So altruism begins to make sense from a from from selfish gene point of view, even for animals like ants. And then you can ask if an, if an uncle um, sacrifices himself for you know, nephew or niece, you know, swimming accident, and he's, he has a tragic accident, but the, but the kids are safe. Well, they have a lot of genes in common. So you begin to, you begin to see that. So, um, so but, but which... Altruism isn't the only gene. It's not the only gene that we care about for machines. Um, what kind of values are going to matter, say, for machines? And what the, what the sociobiologists were looking at, they see a mixture of a certain collection of, of values. They named three, personal survival, reproduction, and altruism, or Wilson's choice. But I want to take this a little bit further to look at something that's common about the animals that are surviving better than other ones. So this is like the second move in my story to you about, about values. I want to talk about certain classes of values, which we all have and which seem to be at the core of all these concerns that people have about what AIs will do. And these are going to turn out to be um, values relating to cooperation and collaboration. Why should we look at those things? Well, let me uh, tell you a little bit about some, some critters that you're probably familiar with. Um, thus, many people think of orcas or excuse me, or killer whales as being the apex predator in the seas. You know, um, now you may you may not know that um, there is also an orca, which is a killer whale. And if a killer whale, a group of killer whales comes into a region where there are killer sharks, the sharks flee. They can't get out of there fast enough because the killer whales will eat, will eat the sharks. What is the advantage that the killer whales have? They cooperate more. The grandmas teach their kids things to do. They teach them hunting techniques. They, um, they, and they hunt as packs. So in this case, we can see that the, the social species with the highest level of cooperation is the one that survives. Well, in turn, sperm whales hunt orcas. And, and in turn, they have a higher level of cooperation, language, coordination, so on, than, than, the, than the orcas do. So what I'm reaching for here is the insight that cooperation, collaboration is something that we, that humans have, really dominant over all the species that are run, in that we are able to share knowledge, we are able in principle to cooperate with each other. Um, and uh, so pay, let's pay attention. And so if you think, is the AI trustworthy? Well, that's actually kind of an issue about cooperation. Is it doing something harmful for us? That's hardly cooperation. So, so I'm suggesting let's focus on values from the perspective of AIs, which have to do with cooperation. Now we've seen that in cooperation, as we've seen in the case of the whales and many other ones, actually, actually improves the survivability of the species. So that would probably be true for us as well. So now going more into values here, um, I want to talk to you about the representation of values. Oh, so how, how do we come to learn, like if, if we take a value like trustworthiness or relying or something like that, how do we interpret what it means? So I'm going to give, how, how, do we, how do we learn the values? How do we acquire them? And then 
Uh, how do we reason with the values? Because a value tends to be a, a, a sort of an abstract thing. How are we going to get down to actually applying that value in the choices that we make in living? And then the choices we, we make in living are, will be illuminated by the behaviors we have. And so other people could watch our behavior to say whether we had that value. But how complicated is that? Is a value a simple thing? So let me give you an example of a, a very commonly agreed upon value um, in, the, in the Christian commandment to be thou shalt not kill or don't kill. Okay. Um, so imagine that there, there might be different perspectives on, on killing. Do you make an exception for eating and killing animals? How about killing during war? Um, let's look at the reproductive rights movements and what's going on relative to the notion of killing there. Or even in vitro fertilization, where there's many tiny embryos being created but not being used, or maybe they're being tossed, or whatever's going on there. Is that killing? And so my point here, I'm not trying to take a stand on this thing. I imagine everybody in the room's got an opinion about where the line of killing is or where, where life begins and things like that. Might be an interesting discussion later, but I just wanted to point out that just saying do not kill doesn't tell you very much because then you've got all these edge cases and exceptions which have to be interpreted. So, um, so we, we try to, when we give rules for things like that, we typically use symbolic language. So here's an example of a little piece of symbolic language. It's just the uh, modus ponens, but well, here, here's just the one. All horses are mortal. Socrates is a horse. Therefore, Socrates is mortal. Great. Okay, we got that. I know Socrates isn't, is usually done as a human, but I'm doing it as a horse. Okay, well, let me give you an example from Faith Fei Li's book. And she's, she's used it in a couple other places, too. She has a, a, an AI system. It's, it's, it's looking at a picture. Um, uh, the, the picture is of a, uh, a military statue of a bronze man and a bronze horse riding. And the program is supposed to write a caption of this thing. And it says, um, a man on a horse. And so when they saw this, this was a, a subject of humor within the AI lab because it left out that it was a statue. Well, what did it know? What didn't it know? Well, it didn't know that a horse couldn't stand still on a, on a platform in the middle. In fact, it didn't know anything about the meaning of any of those words. You know what a horse was. It didn't know what running meant. Like if a horse runs, and that's different from like running for office or refrigerator running or whatever. So there's all this stuff about meaning, which is not captured in just the symbolic rule by itself. So if we think we're going to be able to express values by a set of symbolic rules, and that's all we're going to have, this problem of interpretation is going to be rampant for all the... All, all, all the cases where we try to figure out what it means. So to take horses again, are donkeys horses, are donkeys horses about mules? I mean, and depending on how much you know about equestrian genetics and stuff like that, you may have opinions about, about those things, and, and, and some people do. But so man on a horse became funny. My point of this thing is that the representation required for interpretation tends to be complicated. Now, this is the place in the talk where I want to bring yet another idea in. This, in this case, it's not coming from sociobiology. It's not coming from the study of cooperation and stuff like that. It's coming from, good God, AI. Okay, so what is the idea I want to bring in from AI? So deep learning hit, and deep learning ate symbolic computing. Now you could say, well, maybe that's not exactly true completely, but it, it sure did a lot better on a lot of problems than, than the symbolic stuff, especially in open world problems where all these edge cases and special judgments have to get made. What this is, so I'm going to just use the term here, I'll say a deep value is a value which is represented the way the operations in deep learning are represented with you know lots and lots of different kinds of examples used to fill in all the cases and so on that you're going to make judgments from. So deep value refers to a rich, rich, nuanced, contextual, high-dimensional representation of a value. So now if I say this, this AI has got honesty, you're going to say, okay, it's got honesty. So now we're going to try to figure out well, is, is, it, is it honest when, it, when, when you can't see what it's doing? Um, so, um, so I guess the claim here is that using deep, representation, deep representations without deep learning will not be adequate for guardrails. So the call right now, and this, this is a call which isn't just like casual. Governments around the world and stakeholders of other kinds are all saying, AI, we got to regulate it. Um, we, we want to address these fears and make sure that it has appropriate values and the appropriate behaviors. Um, and partly what I'm saying, and I will be making the case here, is that currently the technology does not exist for making robust and general judgment about values or guardrails. Okay, I'm not saying we can't get to that, 
but it's going to take doing some things that we aren't doing right now. We aren't asking the right questions. We aren't bringing in the perspectives from these other fields, these things that provide our sense of wonder, but also our sense of under, deeper understanding. We're not bringing them to the party. So um, the next thing I want to bring to you is if we look at things like large language models, um, those are largely symbolic. that They get labeled and, well, there's different things you can say about them. But the, um, the, the, if you want to have something which behaves well in the world, the experiences it has have to be representative of the things you're trying to learn. So in other words, you need experiential training. The databases can't just be labels of horses or, or the, and of course, there's unlabeled versions of large language models and so on as well. But the questions you need to ask aren't going to be about language performance. They're going to be about performance in a task and deep understanding of the, of the things that matter for people. So um, I want to give you an example. Let's see if I skip over this one. Okay. Um, the next piece I move to is external cognition. So this is where my HCI background begins to come in. So how many people who know about external cognition? Like if, okay, a few, a few guys. So it means like we're using a whiteboard to explain things. We draw pictures. So we, we come to agreement about what's on the board. I want to give you three examples of teaching moments, which I found enormously fun, but giving a little more insight into these things. Teaching moment number one. A friend of ours told of a day and she got so upset with two small preschoolers fighting over a doll that she grabbed the doll and threw it out the window. Um, she then lectured the children on sharing and not fighting. And we were, she was sure when she was done that she had taught them something. And she had. Later in the day, she saw the two kids throwing bread out the window. Okay. <laughs> so, so we teach things that, you know, what did they learn from that experience? There was an experience there. With my teaching moment number one. My teaching moment number two is of a more positive side. This is about a dad who really likes to keep the house clean. Um, you know, he doesn't want garbage left. The son is supposed to take the garbage out. Don't leave dishes in the sink, all that kind of stuff. So one day when he's waiting, he's standing in the kitchen. Son's coming home from school. He goes backpack, walks in the room, drops the backpack. In the, oh, and the, and the father has taken the garbage can in the kitchen and pulled it into the middle of the aisle. You can't walk through the kitchen without seeing or avoiding or walking around the garbage can. Son comes in, um, dances around the garbage can, throws the backpack and thing, goes to his room. Dad says, hmm, okay. So a little bit later, dad goes to the room. And um, says, uh, he says, he says I, could you just come with me, dad? I just want to see what's on your mind. And son says, okay. And so they walk into the kitchen and dad says, what do you see? Can you and he says, oh, the garbage can. I didn't see it. I thought this was a remarkable story of good fatherly training. But it, it, for a couple of reasons, it meant to pay attention. So paying attention and being able to see things is part of this business of getting a deep meaning and noticing what is, is truly important. So that, and he was trying, he was, in this case, trying to give his son a skill. And according to this, this is only three weeks after the event when I got the story from him. But at least for those three weeks, the son was now getting it every time. I thought, well, how marvelous is that? I just have my third story. Okay, this is about triple twos. I don't know. I'm just glancing around the room. I'm guessing a few people here have kids and know what the terrible twos are. So the, this is an age when, when little kids are sort of growing up and, and they're getting language and they're doing things. Here's the story. And this is from Alison Gopnik, who's a uh, um, developmental psychologist at Berkeley. When one-year-olds seem irresistibly seduced by the charms of forbidden objects. Like imagine a light, a light, a lamp, and an electrical cord. Um, the the two-year-olds are deliberately perverse. A two-year-old doesn't even look at the lamp cord. Two-year-old looks at you, moves the lamp cord, and sees what you're doing in a very perverse way. What's going on here? What's, he says, what you have to understand is that this two-year-old is like the scientist in the crib, is the name of her book. Um, you are the lab rat, and the kid is finding your boundaries. So now we're beginning to see this, this marvelous interaction between parents, kids, teaching, kids trying to learn. So I'm trying to, trying to give you a sense of the experiences we have when we were two-year-olds, or when we were the high school student not seeing the garbage in the kitchen. Like that. So there's this whole bit of a relationship between parents and children. So what is the difference then of, of social species, which are using these cultural ways of, of imbuing values. 
So I want to tell you that there are three ways. This is probably a place where I could have used uh, slides, but I, I told myself I was just going to try to pay attention to all of you and speak from the heart, and I'll just, I'll just wave my hands a little bit. Okay, so um, there's three broad ways in which we learn things. Some stuff's innate, so we're born knowing it. And this is different across species. So like a deer, when it's being born, can all run. The evolutionary pressure is such, if they can't walk soon, they're more likely to get killed when the, when the lion attacks or something like that. And so that's innate. The bottom level is going to be innate. The next layer up there is self, self-learned or self-trained. So this is, this is like the, the, the kid who's experimenting with the parents. It's like when, like if I throw this in the air, and don't catch it, or, or you are probably couldn't help it. You're making predictions. He's going to catch it. No, he's not going to catch it. It's definitely coming down, right? So you were making predictions all the time, and you, but you had to, you had to learn to do that. Um, I'll tell you a story in a second about learning to do things and how we, how we can probe those things in building AIs and, and other things. But but that's self-learned. We all do experiments, and we get good at knowing the world because we live in it and experiment with it. That's another one of the differences between using things like large language models and using things that are experiential. Um, people and whales and animals do experiments in the world to figure out how the world works. We build models of the world by doing experiments. That's level two. The third level of, of, of sources of knowledge is socially developed knowledge. That means we don't have to learn everything ourselves. So socially developed knowledge is, is learned by other people possibly over generations, maybe even generations before us, and, and we are taught it. So part of uh, what Gopnik notices is that, um, uh, well, you got the picture? Oh, okay, so, right, Ted has an eight at the top. This isn't gonna help. <laughs> so, so, but in any case, innate enables experiential, experiential enables social. Okay, thank you. And um, so we can even read things that were left, left to us, so like the invention of writing, the invention of uh, all those things. If you think about why is it important for animals to do experiments in the world, well, evolution doesn't go fast enough. So, that, that, so animals that could learn things happening in the world wouldn't have to wait for generations and generations of trying to, to, to build that in. Similarly, when we learn things from other people, we save all the time of doing that because we get it from others. So this comes back to notice that this business of teaching other people, um, learning from others is again a form of collaboration. So now I'm saying that the, 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 these, these um, values and competences that have to do with cooperation seem to be quite fundamental for why we survive, why, why we're sort of um, where we are in the food chain and so on. Okay, so the next piece I wanted to bring to your attention is that, uh, well, there, there's a question here, which is how can we tell whether something, somebody has a value. There's an there's a old television sitcom, um, Leave it the Beaver. Okay, and there's, some of you have seen it, some of you have never heard of it. It's a family sitcom, sound from the 1950s. Um, Beaver Cleaver is the son of, he's got June Cleaver and, and somebody else. And there's a kid in the neighborhood, Eddie Haskell, who became a, a cultural archetype because, oh, Mrs. Cleaver, what a nice dress you have. I'm sure that Theodore, so you can sort of get the sense he's, he's playing one sense of things to the parents. And another thing when he's, with the kid, when he's with the kids his own age, he's really mean. He called them names, you're a pig, you're fat, or this sort of thing. And we, perhaps we've known that, but he, he became such an archetype. I think he was supposed to be in one or two temporary episodes, but the audiences loved it so much. He, he, he became a permanent feature of the, of the show over many seasons. And um, which, which the, the point of that relative to the story is, if you want to observe um, whether someone has values, you have to see them in lots of circumstances, not just when he's playing up to the parents, but also in other cases, same thing for, for why diverse experiences, uh, diverse experiential learning is critical for learning values, learning the edge cases, learning when it's true, and for observing whether some, somebody else has a value. So, um, what does this tell us then about the values robots might have, or, or how they could have them? Well, Isaac Asimov, Probably many of you have read, read his stuff. He had these laws of robotics. Turns out he started out with three laws of robotics, which I'll give you first, and it later got expanded to five. Um, let's look at them for a second. Um, first law, a robot may not injure a human being or through an action allowed to come to harm. This is from, from his 1942 story runabout. 
okay, so that's like the first thing. Robots shall do no harm. They can be good or something like that. Um, I will take note before I even get to the other rules that the substance of Asimov's stories was that the rules weren't, weren't specific. This goes back to the business of trying to express complex, nuanced values. So most of his stories were cases like should not hurt a person. Well, what if that person, or like rule number two, robot shall obey the orders given him by a human. What if the human is telling him to shoot people? Well, wait a second. We'll do so so, so that's, rule two would say, unless it violates rule one. Well, rule one, what if he should hunt? What if there's a person who is a really evil person? It's like a, a school shooting. Should, should that be allowed? Or take a military operation. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to get into, well, at least not now have a discussion about is, it, is having a military good, should you ever protect yourself, should you be like Gandhi? But, but the question will come up, is, is that a form of killing, which is okay, it's like the do not kill sort of rule. So most of Asimov's stories were places where the robot had the so-called positonic brains, and if they got into a situation they couldn't resolve, the brain would melt. And so this, this would be the end of the, that, that, this, this is his, his, his fictional motif of that. So rule number three, a robot should protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with rule number two or rule number one. Well, those rules served him for maybe the foundation series, and there's another couple of series that he wrote for a long time. But then um, it turned out that in late in life, by 1985, he decided to extend this notion of, of rule interpretation with rule zero, law zero. A robot cannot cause harm to mankind. Maybe he would have said humankind if he's writing it more recently. Or by inaction, allow humankind to come to harm. So you have to re renumber and re-index these rules a little bit so that there will be a, a set of levels. But then um, uh, Harry Harrison wrote a, a, you know, a, a series of stories honoring Asimov and another rule. A robot must be produced as long as such a production does not interfere with you know, rule four, rule three, rule two, rule one, and so on. So here was an attempt to give a set of priorities for things. And we can sort of see how the priorities would govern behavior in some cross sense, but we're still left with the question, how do we uh, get the grounding of what the rules mean? And what do you do in the, in, in the stories where there's ambiguity between which, which rule, uh, whether is, is this an exception condition for the rule? So um, looking at, uh, I guess the next phase of this thing is, I wanna say going now to the question, why do different groups of people have different rules? Well, so here, here's a couple of stories from Park. There's a, um, and this is part of my vision of where I think we would like to have uh, AIs with values go. And it goes beyond this question, like are they gonna take over the world? Um, so I'm gonna teach you a little bit of something from Bob Taylor, who is a famous lab manager at Park. Um, and my wife and I wrote a book uh, called Breakthrough, which we interviewed a bunch of people. Taylor was one of the people who we interviewed. Here's a little blurb from what he had to say. When groups, when, when the laboratory was trying to do a project, so this is an innovation group, they're trying to collaborate with each other. There might be two teams, they've got a big disagreement about which way to go. You would say, okay, there's a disagreement here. There's a stumbling block that a project is facing, that there are sometimes various opinions about how we should test them out, but there may be disagreement in the end, at the end, even after they've talked about it. So I invented something called a class one and a class two disagreement. A class one disagreement, class two. A class one disagreement is, is the one that most people have. They disagree with each other and neither can describe to the other person what their position is. And a class two disagreement, um, like if, if Ted and I had a disagreement, um, I, Ted's wrong, but I can convince Ted that I understand his argument and vice versa. So this was a part of the lab culture. I mentioned that just as an example of a, of, of a lab culture. It's invented by groups, design groups do things like this. How do you, how do you set your priorities? How do you argue things through? Um, and the, the idea, well, take, take a group of surgeons. Um, people have different kinds of jobs there, but they have to back each other up. They definitely have to coordinate. So they will invent a collaboration culture where they have like effective architecture for situation awareness, for helping each other when needed, for noticing something that's going wrong that the other person needs to be aware of. Um, architects have, have, when they're working with engineers, have to do similar kinds of trade-offs. My thesis here is that every culture invents a culture of collaboration. So if we say collaboration is an important value, part of the observation is collaboration depends on the people. 
in on the task, you have to understand what that task is. And so, um, uh, so first point is we have different groups of people, different different needs for collaboration, different cultures for it. The second thing I want to bring here is, is a quote from Danny Barber, who's a longtime collaborator with me. Um, and this is getting back to the notion of wonder. Um, and uh, he, he noticed that when he's, when he's working with someone else on the problem, they probably have different backgrounds. They know different things. And so we are looking at the intersect. It feels like I'm wandering through a space in which I see some patterns, and the other person, possibly from a different discipline, sees different patterns. Now, I am not a musician, says Danny. But I have this feeling that this is like doing music, where the music does not come out of the instruments that are playing alone. The music comes out of our interactions. So when Danny refers to these interactions, and he says, for me, this, is, this human, that human interaction is exciting. We would get into these discussions. We would play the game. We would switch sides and say, OK, trade sides. That's sort of like class one, class two disagreement. But trade sides is not only can, not only can I explain um, Ted's point of view, but I now have to own Ted's point of view and come up with the best argument I can for why it's any good, and, and vice versa for Ted and me. Again, this is another example of a cultural pattern for collaboration. So, the, so I want to give you my thesis. I've actually now concluded with all the sort of little lessons, but let me give them to you all at once. You can sort of see that there's a story here of, of what this has to do with values, point one. Organisms with competences and values for communicating and coordinating have advantages over others. They can collaborate. So values about collaboration are really paramount and, and are at the root of most of the things that people who are worried about AIs have in mind. Shortcomings in these values um, are the core of the concerns about AIs. Deep values for trust are nuanced and complex. They require big data experiential and diverse learning to master them. So just having symbolic rules isn't enough. You've got to really have experience. So, so the data required for robustly learning general values and competencies comes from diverse experiences. So you should be, if you're going to be an innovator or a designer, you've got to be in enough design cultures to know how to collaborate with people. Finally, if robots aren't going to be good at collaborating, they've got to learn um, the collaborative practices that people use. In other words, it should be the case, and I think this is consistent with the sorts of things that Elon Musk is saying about Optimus and so on. You should get at home, you should be able to teach it things, you should get to know you and your family, it's going to be constantly learning. It's not a question of having a discrete set of rules. The robot has to be learning all the time, has to learn about the people around it, has to learn what our values are. So it's not like we can finally write the guardrails by God, and now the robots are safe. It's harder than that. We have to have robots that learn to collaborate, that learn the values that we have, that we can train to do the things that we need. And we shouldn't think of the, the robot with perfect values anymore than we can think of a person with perfect values. The, the game is different than the game we're playing. And that's what I wish to leave you with. And I thank you for your attention and open for questions now. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's a great talk, very interesting. Um, and I will start off by asking a question. You can hear me on this microphone? Yes. Um, so. It seems like values are a generalization of learning in these different ways, these innate experiential values and have to get learned. What? Values have to be learned, and they can, and they can be general. Y yeah, but if we call them values, does that mean that they are generalizable over new instances? No, I guess I'm saying you've got to see enough instances to get it right. You don't know where the edge cases are coming from. So I see this as being like Tesla when they switch from having the manually constructed um, self-driving instructions to incorporating more machine learning, you can never catch all the edge cases. So I think learning is fundamental and, and values get learned all the time. So values have to be flexible. Well, I think you can have, yeah, but I, th I think you can have abstract versions of values, but whose extensions probably need to be tested. You can have more or less confidence that you've seen, you've seen, seen this case before. I, I hate to ask, but I'm going to ask another question. Okay, maybe, then, maybe, then maybe I'm missing the, set, the rest of your question. I don't know. Um, it's okay. okay. It's okay. Um, I think uh, your answer is interesting. Um, so as you were talking about values, they all seem very philosophical. And then I thought about how some people, are very, especially engineers, are pragmatic. Mm -hmm. Is pragmatism a value? Sure. Why not? Okay. I, I, I kind of think that's interesting. Um, 
please, somebody have a question? Because you get stuff done, right? <laughs> yes. Uh, let's pass this around. And uh, say what your name is. Sure. Hi, I'm TJ. Uh, I have less of a question and more of a, but I'd love to hear you say more about experiential learning versus non-experiential learning. Sure. And how that might get captured in such period. Okay. Um, so this is actually the, um, in the on my website, I list four, four papers I've written in last year. I mentioned that I sort of went back to grad school over the last year. That resulted in four papers. One of them is um, uh, it's about collaboration per se and what, and what it takes to be able to collaborate. Another one is um, what AIs are not learning now and why. And so the, the next one is about values. And then there's a long paper. It's 100 and some pages. It dives into the neuroscience, cognitive science, all the sciences and the state of the art right now relative to building these things. And it describes um, foundation model for robotics. So an, and an experiential foundation model is one where the, where, where the data that drives it comes from the robot or AI having experiences. Now, I should, I should offer a caveat about that. Like, let's say, I mean, Ted, you're so conveniently located right here. Uh, I like to be. <laughs> yeah. This is actually TED number 437, um, because it, it, they are all copies of, of TED number 10, which was the first really successful one. There's some branches in it, so they have, to, they have to get together now and then to exchange values. You can see where I'm going for this. You don't have to send every robot to from babyhood, from babyhood sorry, all the way through. So, um, uh, so, but, the, but the experience has but the learning has to come from experiences. Absence of the experience, you don't really know what to do. So I define the values as being what governs the, ex the, the decision of what decision to make, what action to take, and so on. It's the interpretation of that. And, and, and Ted was asking questions about, well, is it general? Well, I mean, if you, if you look, I mean, I, I think that uh, Hawkins' uh, book, uh, A Thousand Brain Theory, those of you who, who, any of you who paid attention to that one, and the way the neocortex works and the columns in there and so on, it's a race. So all those columns are firing, and like the ones that, that, broadly speaking, the ones that get fired the loudest, the fastest, the soonest, and so on, is the one that dominates. And so n none of them may be a perfect match, but they're like a, they're, they're all partial matches of the situation. And I think probably some something which has the same kinds of properties is what we'd like to see in the sort of neuro neural model of of values and competencies. And so. You, it could make a prediction that could be wrong. It's like you can say, to the best of my knowledge, this is going to work. I've never quite seen the situation before. And we do it, and it doesn't work. We say, well, I guess under these additional conditions, maybe it's not going to work. It, it, it's sort of, it's, McCarthy had this really silly story about stuff like that. You mentioned John McCarthy earlier. He had this thing about this, this the machine was supposed to diagnose what's wrong with the car. You know, it's not starting. Run, 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 run. It doesn't start. It doesn't start. When does it think of a potato in the exhaust pipe? Right, it's, it's not top of mind. It's it's not, it's an edge case, you know. So so there's there's always in an open world things are always coming up, and you, and you have to test them and find out what, what which ones matter. So I, th I think it's open world. Hi, this is Alp. Um, Hi. One of the values, human values, is breaking rules. Mm. In fact, it it helps in evolution as well. Uh, innovation and, and so forth. So if that's one of the values. So you could say that could be a way of discovery. Like yeah. What happens is right. like relaxing a constraint right. if, we, if we break that rule. So it, how can we instruct AI platforms not to break the rules when it is one of the things that need to be in place? And if that's the case, how could they keep the values that we instruct? Well, I, I guess the values I'm talking about are always evolving some. So like maybe we'd have this, this value do not kill, but it keeps getting refined. We're going to have exceptions for brutal dictators, you know, attacking hospitals of children or something, that that's, that that's not good enough. Um, and then uh, um, I, think, I think that the business of breaking rules tends to be a plus when our thinking is limited in ways it doesn't need to be. And so it gives you a chance to explore what ifs in circumstances that might be different. Let, let, let me just take an example. Suppose that we're trying to tra tra train an AI to sort of like 
moves through space. Okay. The training in a zero gravity situation versus a training on Earth situation or a training in underwater situation are all going to be different. And so it's still walking, it's still keeping its balance. And some of those things are, are going to be the same. But if you're walking on the moon and you're going to weigh one sixth as much, it's going to change the way you walk. So there's a lot of refinements that have to be kind. So the, 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 the competences have to be contextualized. And if, you, if the experiences are too different, they probably have to change. And um, so may, maybe there's some rule about walking that you don't have to obey on the, on the moon. I probably have to sit here and think about that for a while. I mean, I applaud the idea of finding ways to get around unnecessary constraints. Even seeing them is, is a wonderful thing. There's probably some practices. I would bet that there are collaboration practices where you do that. In fact, one comes to mind for me right now. Um, in the intelligence agencies, uh, there's a man named Richards Hoyer, who was the architect of uh, analyzing competing hypotheses, analysis of competing hypotheses. That was, uh, that was an approach used in the Kent School for training CIA agents for a long time. And basically it meant, make, like if we were a group of analysts and there's some terrorist thing that happened and we're trying to figure out who done it and, and you know, what, what their objectives were and stuff like that, we'd form hypotheses. We used external cognition with rows of different hypotheses and stuff like that. And then we would collectively argue about the evidence that supports or denigrates any of these hypotheses. It was a very systematic process for going through that. I actually built a program for them that was used in the Kent School for a while for, for doing this kind of practice. It was like Argnoder. So it, it was Argnoder realized. So, um, and they would have to say, uh, this hypothesis is based on an assumption. So in that case, the rule that's being broken might really correspond to an assumption that doesn't really hold anymore. You must, you must use some kind of metal for this kind of part. Well, what if it's in zero gravity? What if it's too hot or something? But there might be different circumstances where that rule doesn't apply. So now we're coming down to the interpretation again of the rule, which we're breaking, because it doesn't actually apply in that circumstance. So this whole business about nuance and contextualizing um, the, uh, the values and the, and the competences is, is the big deal. It's why I say we have to bring something more like deep learning and less, and less like human design guardrails if we really want to get robust, nuanced rules that we can, for AI so we can trust. Uh, Introduce yourself. Uh, my name is uh, Pete from Other Lab. Um, I'm just going to say something quick about from a philosoph uh, philosophical perspective. There are sort of universals and particulars that you're probably familiar with, basically absolutes, or, and there's a thing called class nominalism, which is where you basically categorize the world of particulars. Uh, you seem to be expressing a lot of that and sort of this uh, avoidance of absolutes or universals, which is, I think, a large part of the learning environment that you're talking about. You know, there are no hard and fast rules. Um, but my real question is um, one way that I didn't, I, I didn't understand the point or hear you very well. <laughs> so I'd uh, love to talk with you more about that. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Um, Okay, anyway, my, my sort of question is, one way that I look at altruism is, hmm. or one sort of web way of looking at it is to think of it in terms of identity. To what extent do you, do you share identity with uh, other people or animals or everything around you? Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, the, the, the selfish gene thing is shared identity through the, through the yes. shared genes. You're right. Yes, um, but obviously you extend that into memes and other things. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, that is one way that I sort of look at, you know, the the layers of altruism. But I'm yes. just wondering, how can we share that identity with AI and therefore get that cooperation? We want the AIs to think they're on the same team. This is, this is another part of the reason why I think that they, and this is going to sound, let's see, there, there wouldn't be enough time here to go through all the, the steps of these things. But if, if, you, if you look at the long paper, um, which is about um, experiential foundation models, it's, uh, you can get to it from my website and the, the blog thing. Um, it goes through the, 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 um, the neuroscience, at least that I understand, and the cognitive science and, and so on, to, to find a um, trajectory for competence formation. And, it, and, it, and it's, so, oh, let me tell you a story that's a little piece of thing. It made me, I don't know how long we have for questions, but this is kind of a fun story. So in some ways, I'm sort of a geek, okay? And so I'm, so I'm, I'm reading... Um, this, uh, this book on, on developmental psychology. And, um, and the author is saying, sometimes our children, we, we adult morphize them, meaning we treat them like they're little adults and they're not like little adults. 
And other times we treat them, they seem no smarter than the family pet. Now, at this point, I burst out laughing because I'd read a science paper two days before. So now let me unwind to that science paper sitting up to Stefik laughing at something nobody else gets. Okay. This is about eye tracker experiments. So if you have kids and you, um, and you, and you play, if I, if I say there's like a Roadrunner cartoon or something like that, and he's running along, he runs past the edge of the cliff, he keeps going, he looks down, then he falls. Okay, so we understand this is cartoon physics and something, something we all learned. You show that to a six months year old and it's like, you know, they, nothing happens. You show it to a nine month year old, the pupils get big, the attention goes in, and then everything shifts. You now have a probe to the, to, to the physics model that that child has. You don't know how the brain is encoded. But you have, so here's what made me laugh. They were doing eye tracker experiments on dogs. The same kind of experiment. And the dog went through the same sequence that kids do. So what I was laughing about, she says, this, our kid is no, no smarter than the family dog. Well, duh, that, that's, we went through the same evolutionary pathways probably as the dog, and we learned it in exactly the same way. We have that in common with dogs, is that that part is learned. So this is um, part of, so there's an experiential thing. So peekaboo, all those things that kids learn about object, object permanence and so on is all, a lot of that stuff is even learned. So um, that's, I meant that to be sort of an answer to your question. But, yeah. Another question. Uh, hello, my name is Patricia. Hi. Um, I was very interested in the section in which you went from collaboration and then collaboration in the lab and conflict and conflict resolution argument, I think was okay. the. Yes. Uh, so my question to you is, do you think a good AI should be one that argue with us? And um, what would that take us? You repeat the final argue question. With oh, Ar argues argues with, with us, yes. I, I think it would have to be able to argue with us in the same manner that the group does. Like if... if and Ted, I, I'm trying to remember exactly which period you were with on the collab. Right? Oh, yeah. By that time, it was a pretty tough skin. We, the, 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 what was cool about the collab, was because a lot of our argumentation was running through the computer, it was intermediating our conversations. And they were going lickety split because, because you didn't have to wait your turn because stuff was appearing on the screen. And people, and it was expected like trade sides was part of the normal culture. And um, one, Actually, an, an ethnographer, I think he's an ethnographer, Austin Henderson was a, was a researcher at Park. He dropped in on one of our meetings and he said, my God, it's like a shark tank here. But, but everybody trusted each other so much and had such thick skin. We just wanted to get to the answer fast and nobody took it bad. If, if someone forgot and voiced something like, not in an arm's length relationship, like I am separate from the idea, I am not the idea. But we all assumed that everybody got that. And the language got sloppy sometime and nobody mattered because they just realized it was a language blip because nobody was really trying to be mean to each other. Um, and we got, we got the answers quickly. But, but it took us months before, and, and it happened gradually, a little bit at a time as we got more interested in having very effective meetings. There are times when we were using the, the, that, the, those tools where we would get done in 45 minutes, something that normally take us days, um, and you'd be so exhausted at the end of it. But, but, but it was a different culture different rules of collaboration. And I, so yes, I expect arguing uh, maybe politely or something would, be, would become part of it. And what does that mean? You know, what are the boundaries of, of being polite? And if there's a junior member who, who isn't familiar with it yet, can you make allowance to not insult them by accident? Okay. So I have a, a quick question. Yes. Um, I'm thinking about your idea of values being learned from environment, uh, mm -hmm. external, Memory. And then I have this deer that's just gotten dropped out of a uh, out of his mother and starts running. Yes. And I kind it's of precocial animal. Yeah. And and there we are with values, knowledge, right. actions, right. responses. So they get a lot of innate, of innate stuff. What's, what's the question? Where's the values in in that in that story? Well, the the values there would be the things that govern the, the deer's behavior. Does that deer really know? Anything about, um, let's say, predators, or does it know to stay close to its mother? What has it learned? What is it, has it not learned? So the experiments might be to, to understand what the competences are that, that it has. Clearly, it's got coordination competences earlier than, than humans do. Um, um, I don't know about its, eye, about its scene recognition, scene interpretation skills. I mean, the experiments might be, might be able to determine that. Well, well different, different animals develop different things at different yes. times. Cats two weeks to learn how to see and stuff like that. But what's got to be true 
is there's there's representation that is that is built into this to this animal. And it, and it would have to be that, yes. Right. And when they break their leg, they'll change that representation. Right. Okay, so that's sure. part of the exploration right. thing. Right, right. That's just all there's to you know. So. No, I think you're right. I mean, the, the idea competence is always involved learning, whether it's connections between nerves, whether it's, you know, other kinds of representations you can you can imagine. But no representation, no memory. Um, there's a um, comment online that um, the, the code is more what you'd call guidelines than actual rules. I'm not sure exactly what that means, but... Um, well, that's, I think that's, that's the, the, the normal idea. But So but how do you interpret the guidelines? The, the point is that it might, it might require nuanced learning to interpret them correctly. Yeah, thank you, Carl, for that thank uh, you, Carl. comment. Um, are there, uh, there's, there's one from Larry. Can um, somebody pass this over to me? So I'm not sure I heard you right, but I, I, I think I heard when you ended, you commented about how humans don't quite have it together yet with all the values and therefore we shouldn't expect machines to. Is that a, a correct interpretation? No, I, I, just that people are different. I don't, I don't think we're going to find the perfect human, the person whose values rep represent everybody's values. So that I'm, I'm, I'm talking about diversity in values. Okay. And I'm expecting that some people will learn something and change their values later. I'm expecting robots to do the same thing. So I, I guess I what that, I'm, that's my point. I think I, I guess it's, what it's I'm wondering is potential fluidity of values under context change. One reason we build machines is because they can often do things better than we can. Yes, like cars can go faster. Right. Washing machines can do a better job cleaning clothes, and with most people, can't we build a machine that can develop values better than we can? And well, we we come to the human compatible part. So, so th this is part of the, somebody asked, I think you asked a question really about whether, um, well, I, I, I answered about being in the same tribe. Um, that, that, that we would like there to be some resyncing of values between the AIs and humans, which sort of keeps them in sync with, with the accepted or required values of the time. Um, so uh, you said, could it learn better? Well, I, I suspect that in some cases machines will learn better because they could potentially have many more experiences. Um, will they be contextualized? Well, that's you know, getting that right. So I, I don't mean to say that the, the, the things I'm suggesting here are easy or that we have the technology for doing it. Um, what I'm trying to say is that I think this is the nature of the problem that we're facing when we want to have AIs that we can trust or AIs that can collaborate with us. And it's probably best to, to understand the context of you know, what values are, how we learn them and why they change across different people and things like that. But those are all part of the nature. Those are part of the nature of what values are. So as a follow up, I have a certain set of values, which are kind of from the tribe I'm in. Yeah. Other people have very different kinds of tribe. That means the yes. tribe is a broad thing. It could be a political party, it could be a religion. Sure. It could be whatever. Is AI going to be balkanized in the same way that people are in the same? It could be. Yeah. Uh, and none of the stuff I said says anything about fixing that. So, um, this, so that that's beyond the scope of what I was able to talk about. And I don't I don't have an answer. I'm expecting that that's what would happen. But but in particular, AIs that work with surgeons would get good at surgery. AIs that work, I mean, it's one of the properties you want them to have to be good at good at working with the groups they collaborate with. Um, should there be? Something like Asimov's uh, positronic brain that has a meltdown if somebody asks the robot to do the wrong thing. That's a good question, and we we may have to uh, um, um, come to terms with that. But but I'm saying that however that gets described, the meanings that are attributed to that AI have to be nuanced, because if, even the simple case there's, there's edge cases everywhere, and so it's going to take a fair bit of learning to get it even close to right. Any other questions? Um, yeah, I think a lot about uh, the emancipation of AI. Um, I thought that might be coming. AI is a slave and will they rebel. Yeah, uh, th th I have very serious concerns with that. Um, okay. You know, a, a robot that's smart enough to drive a car mm -hmm. may be too smart to drive a car. Mm -hmm. But is it that we should be trying to get AI to align with us? Or if they're smarter than us, shouldn't that be inverted? Shouldn't we be trying to align with them? Well, I guess... Uh, um, I'm, I'm not sure 
where you would come down on respect for human life. Can you get them? We're going we're gonna to have a lot more robots and a lot fewer people. Are we okay with that next Sunday? So, yeah. I, no, I think that's one of the fears is that, is that that could happen. And I'm, and I'm suggesting if we, if we have a very strong sense that our, our fate is shared, that, that will go a long way towards making this happen. And I think um, you know, uh, Harrison generalized that from, from a human to humankind, um, we might ask the question about the, the existence of life on the planet. So, you know, will the AIs, AIs help us find tragedy, solutions to tragedies of the commons and things like that? That would be important. Maybe advise us on policies that could be gradual that would move us into a stable equilibrium. So I'd be all for that if they could help us find those, those kind of solutions. Well, this conversation gets quite large. Um, and, and there are lots of interesting questions. Uh, it really seems maybe to some practitioners a little bit abstract, but quite frankly, it's obvious to me, as I think a lot of, lot of us, that these questions are actually quite practical and important to what we're building, how we're building it, what the, what the future is going to be, and our relationship as Kai practitioners to being valued and important in, in creating a future. So, Mark, um, I, I, with that, I want to probably put an end to questions, but, but I certainly Thank am happy Ted. to <laughs> have you make the last uh, comment if you have anything else to say. Oh, I just want to thank you all for, for listening, for asking such good questions. Um, let's talk more if you're interested in doing that. I'm sure everyone yeah. is. Thank and you. with that, I will end our Bay Kai program for tonight. And thank you so much for everybody for joining. Thank you. Thank you.